Good afternoon, or other time of day as appropriate to your time zone, everyone. Um, welcome back to Kaya Theater for the second half of Saturday of Linux Conf AU. Um, next up, we have Katie Bell telling us about how to run Python in the browser. Katie's 10 plus year career as a software engineer has been pretty darn fun. You should read her full bio in the program because it's pretty cool. Fluent in several programming languages, she's at home, both in both the web browser and deep in the cloud. She's been teaching programming to beginners for a long time and is now an instructor at General Assembly. After her talk, Katie will be taking questions, so please put any questions you want me to read to Katie at the end, if there's time, in the questions tab above the chat in Venulus. And uh, over to you, Katie. Cool, thank you. So yes, this talk is about how to run Python in the browser. And that title is actually a little bit misleading because actually running Python in the browser is very easy. So this talk is gonna be basically structured as firstly an introduction to why we want to do this and what different approaches you can take. We'll spend two minutes showing you the entire code for actually running Python in the browser. Uh, and then the rest of the talk is going to be about making really basic things like standard input and standard output work in the browser. So that's the vast majority of this talk. Actually running Python in the browser is the easy part. Uh, but let's start off with a little bit of why you would want to run Python in the browser, uh, to which I ask you, why not? But possibly maybe you don't like JavaScript. I don't mind JavaScript. I write a lot of it. Um, but if someone doesn't want to learn JavaScript and you would rather write Python, then sure, let's make that run in the browser. Uh, there might be some Python libraries that you want to use in the browser, or maybe uh, you have Python code on the server and you want to share it with the Python code in the client. Um, or possibly you want someone to be able to write Python and run Python without having to install Python on their own machine or set it up or install the libraries. Like you want it to be stupidly easy to like get started running Python by just opening a browser window. Uh, and in particular, that's useful for something like a web IDE uh, where you can just open up a browser tab and have your full development environment. You could share code with other people because it's some kind of web service. And this is particularly useful for education purposes where you might have like a tiny web IDE that lets you learn Python without having to go through the process of like using, like installing an IDE and, and setting everything up. Uh, so for my own purposes, uh, I've been working on a project called Split Code, uh, which is an in-browser IDE with a graphical uh, structured programming language. And in order to be able to write Python code with this language and run Python code, I needed to be able to run Python in the browser. So to run Python in the browser or have some kind of Python environment running in the browser, there are three sort of categories of ways that you can approach this problem. Uh, the first one, running Python on the server. We're not really gonna talk about much today because this is a talk about running Python in the browser. Uh, but if you see a kind of a Python interface or a way to run Python code through some kind of website like Replit or Python Anywhere, uh, it's not running Python in the browser. It is running that instance of Python on some kind of uh, sandboxed environment on a server somewhere, and it's connecting to it uh, via a WebSocket probably. And so you can have a beautiful you know, Python environment with the Python code actually running on the server and not in the uh, browser. And that works well for some kind of cloud IDE thing. Um, but that's not what I wanted to do because I wanted the Python to be a lot more tightly integrated within the browser environment that I was using, uh, and it didn't exactly serve my purposes. Also, if you provide that kind of service, you have to pay for all of the compute power to run that Python, and it's expensive to run the service. If you want to provide the service for free, it's a lot easier if people are running Python on their own machine in their own browser. Uh, so uh, the second option is to, instead of uh, sort of taking Python and putting it in the browser, you build a version of Python that is specifically designed to work with JavaScript uh, in the browser. Um, and it's not uncommon to have like multiple versions of the Python interpreter. So there are different Python implementations that are designed to run in different contexts or have different purposes. Uh, CPython being the reference implementation for Python, the language. So uh, PyPy, IronPython, Jython, MicroPython, they are other implementations uh, that have mostly started from scratch uh, to implement Python um, 
And these implementations take a lot of time and energy to keep up to date whenever the Python language releases a new part of the standard library, or whenever there's a new language feature, each one of these implementations has to do the work to implement that feature. So they do tend to lag behind the latest versions uh, of the Python language, just because it takes a lot of effort to maintain. And some of these uh, projects are, are largely uh, behind now. Uh, there are three implementations of Python in JavaScript Already, these are the three that I found that are still actively maintained. Uh, so Transcript, Brython, and Sculpt. Uh, Transcript is very much a tool designed for someone who wants to write Python syntax, but really they're writing JavaScript. Uh, you don't really have a lot of the Python standard library. You're expected to just use JavaScript functions. Uh, JavaScript functions are just available in the global namespace for you to use, and things like using Python style truthiness versus JavaScript style truthiness on your if statements is uh, an optional flag that increases the size of the JavaScript that's generated from it. So it takes Python, generates JavaScript from it. Um, Brython also takes Python and sort of transpiles it into JavaScript uh, as well, but it has a lot more emphasis on a sort of true implementation of Python and a full and complete implementation of Python. It has a surprisingly large proportion of the standard library implemented, um, with obvious exceptions for things that don't work well in a browser. Uh, it even lets you import and reuse uh, pip packages that are native Python code, uh, that, are, that are pure Python code and not you know native C modules. Uh, so you can do a surprising amount of Python. That is probably the one I would choose if you wanted to have um, a transpiled version of Python that very closely matches uh, what CPython would do in pretty much every circumstance. You could use it to uh, share code between the client and server. Its primary purpose, though, is to replace JavaScript for the language that you can build web apps in. You can use React with Brython. Uh, you can build UIs. It's focused on UIs, manipulating the DOM, sort of fulfilling that purpose of JavaScript, uh, but with Python instead. Uh, and it is kept up to date. Uh, and actively maintained and kept in line with the latest versions of Python, which is really cool. Uh, Sculpt, you'll find as well, is still maintained, although it, they don't seem to be putting a lot of um, time into it. Uh, it's still used. Uh, it's used by educational institutions mostly. And uh, its particular feature is that it has like Python turtle support. So you can do uh, logo turtle graphics and stuff uh, in the browser using Sculpt. But it has a bit of a different focus because it's not designed to be uh, you know, a full Python implementation. Uh, so for Brython, uh, the way that it works is it takes your Python code and transpiles it into somewhat lengthy uh, JavaScript code um, because it needs that much work to be able to accurately execute Python code uh, in a way that is consistent with the way that it would work in the Python language spec. Uh, so Brython is actually a pretty good choice if you want to run Python in the browser. Uh, but it's not the one we're going to focus on today, uh, because uh, we're focusing on the approach that uh, I decided to take, uh, which is compiling CPython, so the reference implementation of Python, uh, into WebAssembly and just straight up running that in the browser. So to introduce this, uh, we need to talk a little bit about WebAssembly and what WebAssembly is. Um, a browser essentially supports running two kinds of code. It runs JavaScript and it also runs WebAssembly binaries or WebAssembly instructions. Uh, as an example, you can take other languages. In this case, we have a little uh, C function that checks if a number is a prime number or not. And what we can do is compile that C function into WebAssembly. And it might look like this if you lay it out in text form. This is mostly for debugging purposes. You wouldn't really use this text form. You wouldn't write this text form. It just helps you see what instructions uh, the WebAssembly runtime has available to it. Um, but more often, you would uh, compile it into a binary form, uh, or you can even include it as an array of bytes uh, in your JavaScript code and straight up run that. Uh, so if you want to play around with this and get an idea of what uh, WebAssembly is like to work with from a uh, development perspective, uh, I would highly recommend uh, Wasm Fiddle. 
uh, wasm fiddle. So this is what I've used to like write a little C function, which is the is prime function. Uh, you can build it uh, and it generates. Uh, you can download the binary file or you can see the code here in binary or text format. And uh, you can, and here is some JavaScript code which loads the WebAssembly module and accesses the isPrime function to run it and call it. Uh, so if I run this, uh, it tells me one is a prime number, oh, sorry, is not a prime number, uh, two is prime, uh, 7,907 is prime. Um, and so we can build a C function, compile it into WebAssembly, and then just call it from JavaScript. And it's running in the same JavaScript uh, thread in the browser. So that's a, a fairly quick introduction to what uh, WebAssembly is. Uh, but we want to use this to run Python in the browser. So what I originally thought I would have to do uh, would be to check out the C Python source code and use a tool called mscripten, which is uh, a tool for compiling C code and other languages that are you know, LLVM compatible uh, into WebAssembly. Uh, you probably need to patch some things or modify some things to get it to fully work in mscripten, get it to compile, and then you have a WebAssembly binary that you can run in the browser. Now, this is a long process, and fortunately, you can actually just use one that someone else has made. Uh, so shout out to the Pyodide project. Uh, this originally started as just one piece of the Iodide project, and Iodide is kind of Jupyter Notebooks, but for the browser, a tool for doing data science uh, in the browser. Uh, and as part of that, it needed to run Python. Pyodide is now its own project, which is just focused around Python, but it does have a very strong focus on data science. So NumPy and SciPy and like common data science libraries uh, are ported to Pyodide uh, and are usable from Pyodide as well. Uh, so the way that Pyodide works, is it starts with the official C Python code, applies a couple of patches, adds some little uh, utilities for interfacing with JavaScript um, and interfacing with the browser environment, a couple of extra C files. It compiles it with uh, mscripten, uh, and generates uh, WebAssembly and then has a JavaScript wrapper around that WebAssembly that makes it very easy to access and use, uh, which is really cool. So this is how Pyodide works. Uh, and so if we wanted to summarize my entire talk, uh, this is how to run Python in the browser. Uh, this is the entire code that you would need. Uh, most of this is just sort of HTML boilerplate stuff. So if we zoom in, um, Pyodide has a couple of JavaScript functions to load the Pyodide uh, WebAssembly binary and run Python just by passing in a string. Uh, so let's see that working. Go to the next demo. Uh, so this is the Pyodide test page. This is exactly the same code that I showed you in the slides. I copied it, pasted it from the slides rather than the other way around. Um, but if I refresh this, it loads Python um, and it prints out the sort of version info and then prints out the number 42. Uh, if we go back to code, uh, we can see that it does import sys from the standard library, prints out the version and prints out the result of 40 plus two, which is 42. So we now have, uh, with just a tiny bit of work, uh, run the Python uh, in the browser. Done, end of talk. Uh, we have now successfully run Python in the browser. So that was the, that was the easy part. Uh, we need to integrate this into the rest of JavaScript uh, because we want a UI that lets us write Python, run Python, and see the output and, and stuff like that from Python. And this is the hard part of the talk. This uh, code for running Python, uh, you can basically pull straight from the Pyodide getting started guide uh, on the Pyodide documentation. Uh, so actually getting running Python in the browser, uh, very, very simple. Uh, and it is a like straight port of CPython. Uh, it's not its own thing. Okay, so building, building a UI uh, is a bit trickier. And we needed to have a kind of terminal where we could see the output uh, and have it sort of printed out. Uh, so I used uh, Xterm, 
uh, which is the same terminal library that VS Code uses. If you see a terminal in a web page, it's probably xterm.js. Uh, then, uh, so I have not shown all of the, the work that went into making the terminal vaguely usable, uh, which was a surprising amount of work. Uh, but here we have, uh, when we load Pyodide, we can hook up JavaScript functions for standard out and standard error so that when something in the Python code writes to standard out, uh, it will call this function with the string that has been written to standard out or standard error. Uh, aside from that, we just need a little bit of JavaScript code that has a button. When the button is clicked, it pulls the code and runs it. So this will make a bit more sense if we can see the UI. So we have a text area and a terminal. And so the text area is where we write the code. When we click the run button, it grabs the code from the text area and throws it into Pyodide. So this code is uh, simplified in the slides, uh, but it's really not that much more complicated than that. So I have a text box here. I can write, oops, print hello world. And I hit run and it says hello world, sweet. We now have a standard out from our Python running in the browser. Uh, if you want to try this and we have things like the uh, standard libraries, if we want, if we want to import random, uh, we can generate a bunch of random numbers using the random library. Uh, if we want to use some, some of the uh, other Python libraries, like the AST module, I can use the AST module to parse some Python code and uh, dump out the AST of that Python code. Uh, you can write functions and run functions and uh, all kinds of things. It's a just straight up C Python port. If you try to do things like make requests to uh, using sockets, you might have a bit more of a problem um, or things that are not super supported by the browser. Um, but for generally what you want to do, uh, it just does work. And whoops. Does work. Uh, it even has a file system, which I can show you. So I have a little bit of example code here where we uh, write to a file uh, and then read from that file again. So uh, reasonably simple, like it opens a file, it writes, hello, this is a file. Uh, and then it opens the file again to read from it and prints out line by line. And if you're wondering, wait a minute, browsers don't have access to the file system, uh, you would be absolutely right. Uh, the file system is kind of supplied as part of uh, mscripten. When mscripten uh, sees that you're accessing the file system in the C code, it will bundle in its own uh, file system implementation uh, under libc. So mscripten during the compile process goes, oh, Python has access to the file system, has code that accesses the file system. Uh, it will sub in its own in memory file system. There are options in Enscriptum to use like the browser local storage or browser uh, index DB to store things in the file system. Uh, the only rule is it has to be synchronous. Uh, it cannot sort of asynchronously start writing to the file system and then like wait for it in the JavaScript land. Uh, it has to synchronously write and read from the file system. And whoops, uh, Enscriptum kind of subs out the things that your C code might normally get from the operating system, uh, Enscriptum supports uh, replacements for those depending on what C libraries you're, you're using. Uh, so it supplies this fake in-memory file system. Uh, it supplies overrides for uh, standard in, standard out, standard error. Uh, it has a sockets implementation that you have to turn on, which uses a proxy server and a web socket to kind of get past the browser implementation. Um, I haven't seen anyone actually using the sockets implementation in, in Anger. Um, it has uh, bindings for SDL, so you can use keyboard and mouse input and joysticks and stuff. And you can draw to a canvas uh, using WebGL uh, through like the OpenGL uh, libraries. And so Enscriptum supplies like a lot of the bindings that you would need to sort of run applications that would normally be interfacing with the operating system. For raw C code that does not interface with the operating system, uh, it should just work. Uh, but the, uh, the ports are needed for everything else. So we have two problems, freezing the UI and blocking on student. So let me demo those problems before we, uh, before we start to fix them. Uh, if I write some code, which takes quite a while to run. So here is just some Python code that counts from zero to 10 million. 
Um, it doesn't print out too much because I found that this was actually the like printing to the, the terminal was the, the slow part of this. Um, but if I run this code, it just kind of freezes the UI for a couple of seconds. Like if we see that again, like normally I can select this text, I could edit the text, I can use these buttons, but while the co code is running, the buttons are unresponsive, the text is unresponsive. Uh, if you accidentally do a like infinite loop, you'll basically lock up the tab permanently and you'll need to get uh, Chrome to kill it. Uh, and you'll also notice that while it's running, it's not actually printing to stand it out uh, until it gets to the end. And that's not because it's not trying to print to stand it out and it's not because the standard out isn't working. It's because it is locking up the main browser thread uh, while it's processing. And so the browser thread cannot update the DOM and cannot update the UI until it's finished. Uh, so this is obviously a little bit less than ideal uh, for running Python code in the browser. You don't want your whole UI to lock up just because your Python code is taking a while. Uh, and the same time, uh, if we want to do something with standard input, uh, by default, standard input is implemented like this. Uh, it uses the browser prompt uh, and brings up the prompt. Uh, so if you wanted to say, right, it's saying enter your name, so enter my name, um, and then it can continue on with the program. The reason it uses a prompt uh, is because the prompt will pause the thread while it waits for the result of the prompt. The prompt is synchronous and it blocks the whole browser thread while waiting for input. Uh, it's non, like uh, you don't, you can't have a browser UI that accepts input while the main thread is blocked in, in any other way uh, because the UI needs to be working for it to accept input. So we have these two problems. Uh, one is whenever we're running Python code, it freezes the UI and two, uh, we can't like block and wait for standard in input when we're running the Python program. Uh, so we need to solve both of these. So normally when you're running a regular Python application, and, oops, uh, and we have a little demo here. Um, oops, I need to get out of full screen for this to work. Um, oops. So if I do, uh, a read from standard in in Python, then that Python process is now blocked. The Python thread is, is blocked until I, until I finish entering the input and then it continues on. So the way that Python works in terms of making a blocking system call just doesn't really work in the browser land, especially not on the main thread because it will block up your whole UI. Uh, so there's two ways to make Python execution stop and wait. Uh, Mscripten has a tool called Asyncify, uh, which allows you to add into the C code hooks to let it stop and, and wait. Um, it does this by kind of unwinding the whole like call stack. And then when it resumes, it will like reload the call stack. It has a fairly big performance overhead, even when you're not actively using it um, and stopping and waiting. Um, but option two is the one we're going to look at, which is having a separate thread and a separate process, uh, which does blocking. And in order to do that, we need to use three different browser features uh, that you might not have used before, even if you do um, a fair amount of web development. And that is web workers, a shared array buffer, and the Atomics library. Uh, so if we have a look at these, uh, a web worker is a way in JavaScript uh, or in WebAssembly in the future to load a separate thread and a separate JavaScript execution context. So uh, the main thread, which is where your JavaScript is normally running, can call new worker and specify the JavaScript file that it should use for that new worker. And it starts a separate thread, uh, which is executing JavaScript. And the main thread and the worker thread can communicate with each other with this post message uh, event that they can send each other, which they can listen for asynchronously. And at any time, the main thread can terminate the worker thread. So this is really useful if you want to say, have some heavy number crunching that if you were to run it in the main thread, that heavy number crunching would lock up the main thread and cause your UI to freeze. Uh, you could instead run that in a worker. Uh, and have it send the result back when it's done. 
Uh, so this worker thread doesn't have any access to the UI, to the document, um, but it is there to do sort of background processing without locking up the main thread, uh, which is super useful for us uh, as we do uh, Python because we can run our Python in that worker thread uh, or in a worker thread. You can have many workers. So the code for this uh, simplified again uh, is in the main thread, we create a worker, which is a separate JavaScript file, uh, and we wait for messages from it. Uh, and we're assuming that the messages come from it, that come from it are strings that are our standard out and we'll just put them straight to the terminal. Uh, and when we want to run code, we can say worker.post message and send it the code as a string as well. And on the worker side, it loads our Python context uh, and loads our Python WebAssembly. And when it receives some code, it runs the code. And when it has standard out uh, strings, then it will post those back to the main thread. So the main thread is sending the code to the worker and the worker is sending the standard output uh, back to the main thread. Uh, and so if I bring another terminal up, uh, we can do the same code that we were running before that was just a fairly busy loop that takes a while. Uh, and when we run it, our UI keeps working and it can output and update the UI with the standard output as it goes because this Python code is running in a separate thread and it is not blocking uh, or tying up the, the main worker thread. So if we run that again, oh, look, it's so beautiful. Um, it's printing out all kinds of stuff, uh, which is really helpful. Uh, it also means that because our UI isn't locked up, uh, I haven't implemented it here, but you can have a kill button that, you know, if you accidentally write an infinite loop in your Python, you can still have a UI with a button where you can click the button and it will terminate the worker process. Uh, so you don't have to worry about an infinite loop kind of completely crashing uh, the browser tab. Uh, but this doesn't help us with standard in because in order for standard in to work, we need to block that worker thread. Uh, and so we do this with the other two browser features that we need, uh, which is the shared array buffer and the atomics library. And so with these two things, uh, we can set up a system which lets our worker process wait for the main thread and the UI to capture some standard in and send it back. So we start off with the main thread launching the worker thread uh, like we did before. Uh, but this time our main thread can send a post message to the worker thread with a shared array buffer. Now this is simplified code that doesn't actually work, but it's sort of pseudo code in JavaScript like pseudo code. Um, our main thread and our worker thread now both have a reference to the same uh, block of memory, All right? That shared array buffer is memory that can be shared between the main thread and the worker thread. So it's under the buff variable in the main thread, it's under the buffer variable in the worker thread, um, but they are using the same uh, bit of memory inside that shared array buffer. And if in the worker thread, we call atomics.wait using that buffer, that worker thread is now blocked. It will wait for that. If there's other JavaScript that's running or other uh, WebAssembly that's running, uh, all of that will just wait uh, until something else happens. Uh, this worker thread is now not using the CPU, it's not a busy loop or anything, it is just blocked. Uh, and in this case, it's blocking on that uh, buffer uh, at index zero and blocking, waiting until it is no longer uh, zero, no longer has a zero value. So on the main thread, we can modify that memory. We can store the number 42 in that, uh, that index. Uh, but when we call atomics.notify uh, on that buffer, that finishes this wait operation. It unlocks, unblocks this worker thread and this worker thread can now continue on with the next line of code or the next thing that it was about to do. Uh, so the worker thread waits for the main thread to finish for the user to like type in some input or something. And then, uh, and all of that stuff can happen asynchronously and the worker thread will block until the main thread calls notify. And so using this, uh, we can implement standard in. Uh, so if we use this example and I bring back the example code I had. So again, super simple code. It uses input to prompt the user to enter the name, waits for that input uh, and then prints the name. So if we run this, uh, 
the worker thread starts processing the Python code, um, our Python code is now blocked. It's now at that atomic dot wait point, and it is waiting for the main thread to call notify for it to wake up again. So uh, my UI still works. Uh, I can enter my name here. Uh, and when I finish entering the standard input, and when I hit enter, that's when it's the main thread is going to call atomics.notify. And then my Python, Python code can continue to execute with that standard input uh, coming in. So very simple program, just being able to enter your name and have it come back to you uh, using standard in and standard out uh, was using a lot of browser features and a surprising amount of work. Uh, but uh, it does work, uh, which is cool. And because we now have actually working standard in and standard out, uh, it means we can use uh, a Python REPL using the actual Python REPL. If you find a, um, the Pyodide website has a, a REPL example on it, but the uh, UI, the REPL itself is implemented in JavaScript and it just sort of sends one line at a time of Python code into the, into the, um, into actual Python. So, but this is a Python interpreter actually running in Python, um, just reading from standard in and printing to standard out. Uh, so, you know, we can, can do all kinds of things, input something like that. So, uh, yeah, we have a working Python REPL. Uh, and if you, it is, it is live on the internet and I have the link uh, in the slides later on if you want to try that out yourself. Uh, so, we now have working standard in uh, and standard out and a full working REPL uh, in the Python in Python using CPython uh, and sort of working seamlessly with a terminal in the UI. Uh, so we needed a web worker to run Python in a separate thread uh, away from the main UI thread. We have a shared buffer to share memory between them uh, and atomics to kind of block and wait for that shared buffer to be filled with the standard input. Okay. Uh, so as a side note, browser support for these features for shared buffer array, uh, shared array buffer, uh, and atomics in particular, uh, is a little bit patchy. And that's largely because the browser started supporting it. And then when Spectre happens, they realize that this was actually a very big security concern, uh, and browsers removed support for the shared array buffer. Um, and atomics was generally still there, um, but is not very useful without the shared array buffer. And so uh, bit by bit, browsers have been re-adding support for shared array buffer, um, but with a bit more security uh, implemented in it. So in particular, in order to use shared array buffer, the page must be running in a cross-origin isolated context. And this is mostly to stop uh, something like, oh, I embed some ads in an iframe, but that iframe can use shared array buffer to spy on the rest of the process. Um, and spy on what's happening in the main the main thread. Um, so you can only use shared array buffer uh, in the context where uh, you can guarantee everything's coming from the same origin, or at least was specifically allowed. Uh, so um, the support across browsers now, once you have added these headers for your site, uh, is is pretty good. Uh, Edge, Firefox, Chrome, they all support it. Safari only just recently re-added support for it a couple of weeks ago. So if you're on the latest version of Safari, uh, then you'll have it. Uh, it's pretty good on mobile as well. Uh, now, but if you look at Atomics, uh, the Atomics library, which is very necessary for this whole approach, um, doesn't look like it's very well supported uh, at all. Uh, it's actually is because the can I use data is out of date. Um, it hasn't been updated for uh, like the latest Safari did add support for it, but it's not there. So I've been going through trying to find all of the browsers uh, that do support it, even though the uh, MDN data doesn't say that it's supported. And it is actually supported across more browsers uh, than you would think. And I'm working on, I have uh, one PR sent already to update it, uh, and I need to work on a couple more to trace down exactly what versions it was added in. So the browser support for shared array buffer and atomics is actually better than it looks. Uh, at the moment, um, and it has pretty wide support. Uh, looking forward, um, I'm working. I want to work on more uh, Python library support uh, in uh, in the browser. Uh, I want to be able to do things like uh, graphics, drawing to a canvas, um, making sure all of the audio stuff works. A lot of that stuff will already work uh, thanks to Mscripten's 
uh, libraries, um, but uh, making that easier, making sure it all works, um, as well as uh, supporting making network requests, uh, which is going <laughs> to be an interesting security question. Um, there is uh, progress in underway to add support for threads and atomics uh, into WebAssembly itself. So you don't need to sort of drop out into JavaScript to be able to do those things. You generally don't need to do that now, um, but it's not this uh, threads and atomics is not an official part of uh, the WebAssembly standard yet, even though a lot of browsers do support it. Um, there is another project, which I only found out about recently, uh, where a couple of CPython core developers are working on building support for compiling CPython to WebAssembly oops, uh, without any patches. Uh, there's also a proposal to add atomics.wait async, which would allow the main thread to sort of asynchronously wait on a shared array buffer, which would remove some of the necessity of uh, using post message to send standard out back from the main thread. You'd be able to have the UI update without the overhead of using a post message and serializing everything. Um, and there's also some really interesting work going on for using WebAssembly for sort of quote unquote native apps running WebAssembly outside of the browser with access to the operating system, uh, which has some really cool potential for sort of native like speeds, but allowing the same binary code to be portable across uh, architectures, uh, which would be really cool. So in building this, uh, a lot of credit goes to Ben Taylor, uh, who helped a lot with getting the terminal UI set up um, because he also has his own project. Uh, and Greg Dark was super helpful explaining things like uh, blocking system calls to me. Um, Ben has his own project, which you should absolutely check out, uh, called Runo uh, at runo.dev. Uh, it is an embeddable editor and execution environment that you can include in any website just by including an iframe. Uh, and that also uses WebAssembly to run Python. Uh, but it is not an inscription version of Python. It's a different version of Python. Uh, and it's built using uh, WASI instead of inscription. OK, uh, so yeah. That's my talk, uh, and I do believe we have some time for questions. Uh, I can't hear you, Betsy. I don't know if everyone else can. That's because I had myself muted. Okay. It was bound to happen. Um, <laughs> thanks for telling me, Katie, or I would have kept going. Um, yes, we have plenty of time for questions, and we have a few questions there. Um, so thanks again, Katie, for that talk. Um, that was just as fun as I was hoping it would be. Um, I love seeing things run in places where they were never designed to be run. Um, and speaking of, um, our top question is, can Inscripten itself run in the browser? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever really looked into like how Inscripten itself is run. Um, if it think is be <laughs> itself written in C, then maybe it's not really doing much except sort of reading files and doing a lot of processing. So I imagine it would, but I have never tried. <laughs> I don't even um, know if it's written in C. <laughs> <laughs> Something for the asker to play with. Yeah. Uh, how large is the WebAssembly executable of Python executable in quotes? Oh, that's a great question because the PyDI team has made, put a lot of work into this. Uh, it's surprisingly small. It does take a noticeable amount of talent time to download, um, but it's something like, like the whole download would be in the order of six or seven megabytes. So it is less stuff to download than loading the New York Times homepage. Uh, it's, and it, it's good it, like, comparison. you can sort of see it if I open it up and we open the inspector and the network tab. All right, let's have a look. And the whole thing is 7.4 megabytes of, of transfer stuff. So a lot of that would be um, here in the Pyodide data and WebAssembly, which is 3.4 megabytes and 3.6 megabytes. Makes yeah. sense. Could be a lot more. It could be. It was a lot more, um, but <laughs> uh, it's gotten better. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Okay, next question. 
if standard n is blocking execution of the worker thread, can you launch another worker thread to allow continuing execution? Uh, yeah, you can launch as many worker threads as, as you want to run separate uh, Python. Uh, they, they'd be sort of separate Python. I mean, I'm going to say processes, sort of. They're sort of. They wouldn't be able. To, they wouldn't be sharing their variables between them. They wouldn't be sharing memory between them. But yeah, you could run two copies of Python uh, in separate worker threads, uh, just fine. That makes sense. How easy would it be to get non-supported libraries running? Uh, so Pyodide already has support for uh, libraries that are written in pure Python. Uh, so you can use uh, pip packages if the pip packages are implemented in pure Python. Uh, it will. There are some Python libraries that uh, Pyodide has specifically built support for, uh, things like NumPy, uh, that have a lot of native code as well, uh, but you would have to separately compile any native code into WebAssembly for it to work. Um, I've not gone through that process myself. Um, it probably depends on uh, how easy or hard it, like what, what the library does and how easy or, or hard it is to, to wasmify. Um, but if it is just doing something like calculations and not relying on the operating system, then I imagine it's pretty doable. Um, that being said, I have not attempted to do that myself. I'm very glad to hear that they've already sorted out NumPy because that would be the worst to try yourself. <laughs> yes. Um, have you got test results on what performance hit the WebAssembly translation then execution causes compared with native Python? Um, I haven't done any benchmarking myself. Uh, the Pyodide project quoted something like uh, two to three times uh, as like slower than CPython. Um, so it is like there is a noticeable performance hit compared to CPython. Yeah. Um, next up, why do you need a shared buffer to send standard in data rather than using the post message function again? Uh, the big problem is that the post message uh, needs to be asynchronously received by the worker. And so once you call, like while it can't asynchronously receive that standard input until the worker thread is unblocked, um, it can't kind of store it and then uh, start using it as soon as it, it as soon as the wait is over. Um, so it has to wait for the standard input and then get it synchronously as well. Um, but if you tried to do that by sending a post message, uh, it wouldn't receive the post message asynchronous like event until after it had finished requesting the standard in synchronously. Not sure I explained that very well, but uh, it sounds like something yeah. that needs like diagrams. Yeah, with the block. <laughs> Maybe I should have added everything. a diagram for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, that call to like read standard in from WebAssembly can't do anything asynchronously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you know whether any bigger sites use existing systems like Brighton in production? Uh, I don't know of any bigger sites that do it. If you go to the Brighton website, they do have a list of projects that use Brighton, um, some of which are sort of just regular web apps. Um, I didn't notice any big names, not from memory. Um, for Pyodide, uh, sorry, but it has a list of projects that use Brighton. A lot of them are, you know, run Python in the browser educational tools. Yep. Um, for teaching Python. Uh, in the same way, um, the Pyodide site lists projects that use Pyodide, and most of them are data science tools. Um, so like that sort of follow the, the Jupyter Notebook style interface where you have chunks of Python code uh, that you can execute. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, we are just about out of time. Um, there are, there's, one more question, which I'll leave for the chat um, in the post-conference, post-talk chat. I'm already not able to say the Kaya Theater post-talk text chat. Um, I'll paste that one in. Um, and also quite a lot of people in the chat and in the questions are asking for a copy of your slides, Katie. Um, so just so you oh, know. Okay. Uh, but thank you very much, Katie. Uh, that was a really interesting look into the mechanics of running things in the browser. 
Um, and that's it for now. Back in 10 minutes. <laughs>